that was unexpected. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't really sure what to shoot this week. Forming opinions of informed worth at this point seems impossible. Not addressing it at all sounds a lot like denial. The last official video I uploaded was my 40 before 40 list. And if you haven't watched that, it's an untouched piece of art from a lost age. Look how innocent she looked. And I'm kind of glad. It's 40 things I want to do before I'm 40 that hasn't been tainted by this insane global crisis. And as the carpet is pulled from under me as it is everybody else, it will be very interesting to see what I follow through with from that list. Oh, I miss the carpet. I miss the carpet so much. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who joined me between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. every day last week for five creative live streams called Lena's Lock-In. Um, I'll leave the links to those below if you would like to just create. I wrote a lot of poetry about store cupboards and uncertainty and empty bus stops. But the thing is on my channel, I have this series called Positive Panic. And if the one time I chose to not upload a video when the world is genuinely panicking, I would fill a void as perhaps would you. However, I didn't script this because this is now feels like a world without scripts. It felt false to script this. And because I don't really have that many answers, I don't have a point to make, I guess, apart from the ideas and feedback from myself that I have that I'm gonna express in this video. So here are four inevitably flawed, misguided things that I think we can do uh, in this time of panic. Whatever position you're in right now, I encourage you to accept your feelings. That's the first step, I think. Uh, if you're feeling angry, feel angry. I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about how many people describe me as a happy person and how unseen I feel by that statement. I don't know if you're a naturally cheerful person. I think I'm cheerful. Am I positive? I'm not sure. Judging by the monologue rampage I had on the on the phone to my parents last night, it would seem that I am actually quite angry. The part in Little Women that I feel most seen in is the part where Joe March is just like, I just feel angry all the time. When I get in a passion, I get so savage. I could hurt anyone and I'd enjoy it. You remind me of myself. But you're never angry. I'm angry nearly every day of my life. And I think sometimes if you're somebody like me who has like a generally positive demeanor about you and wears obnoxious sunflower dungarees when the world is going up in flames, <laughs> people use that to undermine your knowledge of the situation. Like, I think people can read that as you not really understanding. And I would urge you to fight that when you express anger or sadness or disappointment. Um, I think that holding your knowledge that the world is fundamentally um, a good place and is getting better, whilst also expressing deep frustration, deep anger at the way things are being handled, the bad advice that's being given out, the advice that's being ignored, the grown-ups that are not acting like grown-ups. Once again, the grown-ups do not have it covered. <laughs> Harking back to my first episode. Acknowledge that your disappointments might not be as big as other people's, acknowledge that your fears might not be as big as other people's, but they all exist, like it, it's not one without the other, you can't have the micro without the macro. And I think I can be incredibly worried and donate to food banks and worry about the people whose really their, their lives are on the line for this, and also simultaneously at the same time be very disappointed that my Meryl Streep 30th birthday themed party is going to be cancelled. <laughs> So I think acknowledging how you feel and not judging yourself for how you feel, picking which of those emotions you act on is very important, but acknowledging that all the feelings are there is really helpful. Those emotions pop up at random moments and they don't always pop up to scale. I didn't cry until I remembered one of the best bookshops I've ever been to, but haven't been there in years called Scarthin Books in a place that I don't live um, and rang them up to order some books because I knew that they would be struggling. And when I told them that I remembered visiting their bookshop years ago and I loved it, but I lived in London, could they post me some books because I wanted to support them? The lady on the other end of the phone sounded really moved and then I started crying. <laughs> um, and I think that's not the biggest, that's not the biggest, oh God. That's not the biggest thing to happen in the world this week. That's not the biggest, most life-changing thing I could have done to help this this pandemic, but I accepted that it was symbolic for me and that was a moment of crying and that was okay. Number two is realize your world wasn't stable to begin with. Steady, Lena. As I wandered round the streets and everybody looked panic and had masks on and there was crowds in the supermarkets and it was all, it was all a lot. There was a guilty comfort that came um, I feel like I've been wandering around feeling a big sense of doom about 
planet things for the past six months like a really heavy feeling that everybody else is carrying on as normal and that i'm in some dystopian world and that um nobody else realizes that they are in it there was almost like a guilty kind of comfort in in knowing that i wasn't alone anymore like everybody else felt like the world was now unpredictable that it was unacceptable to stay comfortable and it reminded me of one of my favorite poems by alice walker that i'll read for you now <clears throat> it's called expect nothing expect nothing live frugally on surprise become a stranger to need of pity or if compassion be freely given out take only enough stop short of urge to plead then purge away the need wish for nothing larger than your own small heart or greater than a star tame wild disappointment with caress unmoved and cold make of it a parka for your soul discover the reason why so tiny human giant exists at all so scared and wise but expect nothing live frugally on surprise oh it's so good what the fuck i fucking love poetry <laughs> Oh my god, I'm such a loser. So basically, it's that thought of like, how fractured the world already was and how much we allowed ourselves to carry on like it wasn't. How a culture of listicles like mine and goals and personal dreams are all quite fraught when they're not brought together with the reality of how thin the ice we live on is and how disconnected we are from... Oh, I hate the word gratitude. I feel like the word gratitude has been really like taken over by the wellness industry but like gratitude and presence in the in the moment like the the act of living not having lived and not basing all of your happiness or all of your um excitement about the future uh basing your excitement in the present reeling that back reeling that fucking kite back in and being like oi get back down here <laughs> um good stuff is happening today um that I, I struggle to do myself and it's something that I need to kick my own butt at. But realizing that, that like everything that has been canceled was never guaranteed. It wasn't owed to us. It was a possibility. It was never a certainty and how that informs everything else. I feel like I've had that wake up call once or twice in my life, um, but it's good to have it again. And if it's your first time, welcome. The world is a tedious and ramshackle place. Yeah, and accepting that the world has never been stable and never will be. But happy to be here anyway, frankly. Number three, reach out to others. And this is in a meaningful way. Um, something that did make me cackle was thinking about all the businesses and all of the industries that have always thought their digital team was like a kind of add-on, like a Meccano hook-on to the rest of their business and wasn't fucking running everything. Um, and all of the people that have always like thought about social media as a job being like kind of like, mm, and now turning to their digital teams and being like, please help us. And their digital teams are finally like, I finally feel seen and I will help you. Anyway, off the point, reach out to others is the point. Thank you for everybody who came to Lena's lock-in. Um, I might do that again, but that was a great way of kind of spending time with people digitally. I've been calling people more. I've been realizing who I don't miss. I've been realizing who I really want to check on, even though I'm really shit normally at keeping up with them, but who I like immediately was like, oh my God, I hope that person's okay. Joining groups, here are some ideas. Vintage Books have a classics book club on Facebook that is wonderful. You should totally join it. Laura Dockel is running writing classes from her Instagram stories. Uh, everybody on Instagram seems to be doing live. Write to people again. And I'm gonna be writing to a lot more people at the moment and um, I've been posting out lots of zines as well, which has been really lovely, but giving people tangible non-digital things um, that they can touch in the post is really lovely. Join an online community, especially maybe around like your favorite creator. Uh, so I have the Gumption Club, if you want to join that. There are so many lovely people in that. We're also starting our own little book club, I think. We chat every day on Facebook and it's fucking lovely. But I'm putting on screen five other creators as well who I know have really lovely patreon communities uh, and that's such a lovely um, affordable way to keep art going during this very trying time for freelancers but also um give yourself a little online family of like-minded people because i know the people that you might be in isolation with are not the people who might be spiritually intellectually or politically aligned with you and that is okay but do seek out the like-minded people that you might have lost from your life and talking about meaningful connection number four is pretty key for that start talking about what can change. I have been very conscious um, recently about when I reach out to people that that is all we talk about. And obviously at the moment we're all aghast, we're all shocked. But when this is shook down, 
What do we talk about that's truly meaningful? And I think this is an amazing opportunity. While all the threads are loose, while the brains are loose and a little bit more open than normal, um, to talk about what kind of world we want to return to. Because something that I said when I ranted to my parents on the phone last night was that I don't want to go back to the way things were. It's exposing that the way things were were quite shitty. So I think having meaningful interactions um, with people about the way things can change in the future um, would be a really cool thing to do. It's not just about the amount of time you spend with people, it's the quality time. So I've made a list. <laughs> things we should possibly reconsider in the light of coronavirus. <laughs> uh, number one, fast fashion. No one is seeing us and we're not going to any occasions where we purchase stuff. So one of my paid gigs was presenting at a pretty big award ceremony in which is either postponed or not happening anymore. And I had spent hours stressing about what dress to buy, um, whether to buy a dress at all, whether to borrow a dress, what would I look like? Would they think I looked I look smart enough to, to have been paid? <laughs> Effectively representing another brand, how did I look on brand, but also like myself? And it was like a whole thing, and that whole bit of my brain has now been taken out. I don't need to worry about that occasion, whether that was like a wedding or um, a big gathering or a big performance. Those big occasion moments that we tend to splurge money on aren't happening. But why were we stressing so much about what we wore to certain events? And why was it okay to set aside money to buy something new so that you didn't look the same as you did in the last wedding? And then also, what are we wearing when nobody sees us? Something that's fascinating for me is that I'm definitely still wearing makeup and I, I'm loving it. And it's just something that makes me feel really great and good. And I've always said I did that for me, but now I'm literally seeing no one. That's interesting. And also, how do you dress when nobody will see what you're dressed like? Is that your true style? Will this be a challenge to fast fashion? Months of everybody staying indoors and not having to like turn up for the Joneses? Universal basic income. This one should be an obvious one and I've been banging on about this for years. Trusting companies to handle global epidemics obviously hasn't worked. If everybody had a universal basic income, things would definitely, I can say, I'm not an expert, but I can definitely say things would not have spread this far so fast because when people were told that they should, should come into work when they were ill, they could say, nah, I'm gonna stay at home. <laughs> it gives people a base survival rate so they can act on their conscience and on their um, own regulations of safety rather than trusting randomness to do it for them, frankly. Unions, how do they function? Should you be in one? What are your rights when your company goes, oh, we didn't really plan for this? Power structures in general. Are the right people deciding on very, 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 very important split decisions um, in an emergency? Should that always be the government or should we also have a contingency of experts who have to be part of the conversation and not just consulted, but have to sign off on it? Just an idea. Transport. How much of it did we really need to use? And, and while I know the Positive Panic series is supposed to be about the environment, I haven't been bringing it in so far just because I want to focus on our general panic. Um, and I'd like to do a bigger episode more linking this to climate change. But in this instance, that's where it links most obviously for me is what, what, a, what does a panic look like for the government? When they said they called a, a, a climate crisis, I don't see the same kind of colossal change to what has so fast been able to happen here. Now I know what they look like in crisis, I'm going to expect more from them when they say w that they have declared a climate crisis. So now we've seen them panicking. It begs the question, well, so when we had that meeting about climate change every year for the past fucking four years, you said you were panicking then. It seems like now this is your panic. Now I'm seeing what your panic looks like. But yeah, so for transport is one of them, like what's an essential holiday? You would cancel your holiday to protect vulnerable people in the present but would you cancel your holiday to protect vulnerable people in the future? One of them being you. So flights and transport in general is an interesting one. Working from home. I'm very fascinated to see how many companies can really get all of their workers to get back in the office. Now that all of those people realize that it's actually very possible and functional and they have three months worth of, of evidence to show how functional it is to work from home. It's no longer a nebulous hypothetical situation. Um, that employers can be like, now that wouldn't work. And I know there's a lot of people from regions all over the UK that work in London who aren't that keen on working from London. They want to work from where they're from. Is this gonna make companies more regional in the UK? I have questions. Whose death concerns us? That's what I wrote down on the list. That is very ominous and probably needs another video unpacking it all together. But just think about that sentence. Whose death 
concerns you generational race class what stops you from being concerned about some somebody's death and not about another person's death and what does our reaction to this situation say about how we don't react to other situations sorry i feel like we're stressing i'm stressing you all out again <sighs> these are just things to talk about with your friends <laughs> you just whatsapp someone and be like hey what are you up to nothing just thinking about whose death really concerns me <laughs> Might not be the most light-hearted one, but what the government looks like when it really declares an emergency. If this is an emergency, was the climate change crisis? Did you, were you really pressing the red button with that one? Were you? But also how we balance that with eco-fascism and the idea that the that nature is more important than human life. And there's a whole Twitter thread about that that I found very informative that I'll leave below. But yeah, just being conscious of the fact that just celebrating the fact that the um, canals in Venice are clear again doesn't balance out um, the global human suffering that's happening because of this um while your vote really matters i imagine that the conversations that you have with people in your life who are like i don't know if my vote really counts are going to be a lot easier after this i'm hoping so how do we make that so how connected the world is brexit might be on pause it's all happening but like how countries are so fictional how they don't really make sense how would you like to reimagine the idea of country and belonging um in the light of this crisis how important digital and marketing teams are my hearts go out to all of the publishers that bought outdoor advertising for this season because nobody is walking past the billboards so that's some marketing budget that is being reassigned currently i imagine all over the uk how close so many people are to poverty in the uk how paycheck to paycheck lifestyles aren't really fair on anyone um they don't function well in a crisis they don't function well in a non-crisis we don't like to see it we would like more stable finances for everybody please after this how do we get socialism now please and then lastly for a generation or for a world that was supposedly so addicted to their phones realizing how much has to be cancelled how often we interact how often we touch each other <laughs> You know what I mean? How how much physical contact comes into our everyday lives, whether that's in the supermarket or getting our nails done or giving someone a hug when you see them or greeting somebody, um, the amount of meetings that really do still happen in person. I don't think we were as digital as we thought. I think we were pretty fucking analog because if we weren't, the world wouldn't be fucking crumbling right now, would it? And so for all that, I'd say, thank God for social media. I almost deleted Twitter. And now look, I still think being addicted to social media is obviously not good, but using social media, especially in a time when you need support from people and you need to find different advice and different opinions. Social media literacy is what we need. It is not to give up social media or digital um, communications. No. So having a talk with your friends about that and how we, how we see that working in the future is really interesting. I don't view the guilt around screen time in the same way now that the only person I can see is my boyfriend. Um, I wanna read you one poem that I wrote during the lock-in. Um, I'm gonna be posting lots more to Instagram, so if you don't follow me on Instagram, I am gonna be going poetry slap happy um, now that we're in confinement. Um, but here's one that I wrote during the lock-in that I thought was interesting. <sighs> the, the prompt was the biggest lie. The biggest lie I was ever told was that happiness was a static place you could reach and bed down in, a cocoon of certainty to arrive at and eat Pringles and forget the world in. Not what it really is. A stop you pass on a merry-go-round, visit every rotation, a familiar place to visit, but when I try and leave my toothbrush there, the bathroom floods and I have to pack my bags again. So it's that idea that happiness comes in spirals while panic is something to be felt and harnessed uh it shouldn't come as a surprise um we live frugally on surprise remember we love a bit of surprise but that our lives often spiral through the center um i think i heard this somewhere have i invented this i'm not sure here's happiness and here's sadness and your life kind of spirals between them and the coil might get looser or tighter so if when the coil is looser i guess you're spending more time in a happiness rotation and then more time in a sadness rotation um, and they're more extreme and you're extremely happy or like you're in a tight curl formation where it's like i'm happy i'm sad i'm happy i'm sad i'm happy i'm sad um but it it is always going like this um and 
I don't know what we have to learn from that apart from I think the coil is the coil the coil is fucking with our heads right now so I hope um that was in some way helpful and if not at least pass the time thank you for all your support particularly thank you to the gumption club who I have been beyond lovely um during this time for me and to each other uh, so thank you to them and if, and if you are interested in joining you get 200 unlisted videos from me a very embarrassing older videos from my channel so you can enjoy that and laugh while you're in isolation a free poetry collection a free online zine a short story a book club and like 900 new friends you can watch the rest of the positive panic episodes here you can subscribe here if you'd like to stick around uh and i'll see you in my next one frog snog out